I'd like to introduce um, Sally Watson now, please, who um, I first heard on the Society of Architectural Historians uh, Great Britain talking earlier on in uh, a few months ago or a month or so ago. So Sally Watson is a third year PhD candidate at Newcastle School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape. She has degrees in planning and architecture. And amongst other things, she's been a curator of drawings and archives collections at the RIBA. And now she is um, researching the development of the biker estate in Newcastle with a focus on how landscape was designed to facilitate play. So welcome, Sally. Thank you. Thanks, Annabelle, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it was really lovely, Marie, to see that the British architects' lives mentioned, and that's um, Ralph Erskine is, is one of the interviewees in, in that series. And um, I'm not going to, to I haven't actually, I have used it, but um, in, in this, the context of this talk, it, I have, it doesn't come up. Um, I'm going to talk about the interviews that I've done. So let me just share my screen. Okay, can you see that? Uh, yes, that's great. Right, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about my research into biker and designing for children's play, and in particular, the value of interviews in the, the interviews that I've conducted in this research. Before I go on to that, um, I just wanted to say something about the archive that I've been using as one of my main sources. The RIBA is the collaborative partner for this research, and they've allowed me to access their previously unresearched Erskine office archive. This archive is incredibly rich and contains a very wide range of material, including design, presentation, working drawings, office records, minutes of meetings, correspondence and photographs. And there are even children's drawings which were pinned to the office walls. There's a valuable social history here in addition to the more expected practice history, which is partly as a result of the community engagement um, undertaken by the office, but also down to Mike Drage, who you'll see credited in many of these photographs, who donated the archive in the mid 80s to the RIBA and, and also the RIBA themselves for accepting this archive in its entirety. You can see in this photograph, um, uh, early bike, early photograph of biker, a playground is nestled into a newly landscaped area. And these playgrounds are mostly gone now. And I wanted to find out more about how they'd come about and, and why they were removed. So no doubt many of you are familiar with the story of biker, but for those who aren't, um, before I get onto the subject of children and landscape and biker, I'll tell you a little bit about biker and describe how the redevelopment came about. Here's some images of old biker. Um, biker is a residential area in the east end of Newcastle, close to the river. It was a working class area with terraces of Tyneside flats. These look much like houses from the outside, but actually they are upstairs and downstairs flats with their own front doors. They had back lanes and leading onto backyards and they kind of ran in lines down quite steep hills, usually down, down to the river Tyne. By the 60s, these were in a really bad state of repair and they lacked bathrooms and modern kitchens and the majority were let out to tenants by landlords who didn't always maintain them very well. The area had a lot of community buildings, such as schools and churches and pubs and baths, and a very busy central shopping street, Raby Street. And as one interviewee that I talked to said, it was a really tough place to grow up, but it was also described by very many people as being a close-knit community. And actually, one of the things that I've come across in the archive is discussion of making some of the streets as they're redeveloping the area into play streets and, and this is quite an interesting this is photograph of evidence that that took place um in the kind of while they were waiting for new biker to come there was it was there was perceived to be a need to make the kind of current streets safer for children so newcastle like many cities had ambitious redevelopment plans in the 1960s um, the infamous leader of newcastle city council t dan smith restructured the council and established a powerful planning department under the city planning officer, Wilfred Burns. Early housing schemes in the west of the city involved comprehensive redevelopment where areas were cleared of so-called slum housing and replaced by new housing. People who lived in these areas were dispersed across the city and sometimes further afield. 
So schematic plans for similar development were drawn up for Biker alongside plans for an adjacent urban motorway. These were very heavily influenced by Colin Buchanan's Traffic in Towns report, the steering group of which included T. Dan Smith. And in the plan on the left, you can see the proposed motorway, the sort of grey hatched area, um, which was sort of to the north and to the east. And then in the sort of centre, there's sort of secondary road system and access roads leading to residential areas. And on the right, you can see the perimeter block, which is marked out at the northern part of, of Biker. I'll use my cursor there. Um, and then sort of other kind of various housing densities beneath this. So by the mid to late 60s, there was a backlash over comprehensive re redevelopment and a growing call to keep Biker for Biker people. And this culminated in the appointment of Ralph Erskine, a British architect who was based in Sweden. And one of the primary reasons for his appointment was said to be his interest in participation, something which was shared by planners in the council, albeit with a limited sense of what this might involve. And the text here, which comes from the report submitted to the planning committee in October 1968, not long after Erskine was approached by the council and prior to his appointment, reads, the committee will undoubtedly wish to respond to the desire of people in Biker to participate in planning of their area. And it is suggested that if this report is approved, they may wish to have it printed and made available on a wide scale in the area so that the people of Biker may be informed about the proposals we be enabled to respond to them. As the work develops, progress reports of this nature will be issued from time to time to ensure the to ensure continuity of the process of providing information and consultation. And you can see Erskine's comment, hurrah, <laughs> next to it. Um, this was, there were other notes on this report, which he'd written to his daughter and um, Anna Nilsson, who, who visited Biker before they took the job on to, to sort of, to do a, their own report on, on what they thought about the area. So Erskine was commissioned in April 1969, and over the course of the next 13 years would go on to build around 2,000 houses and flats in Biker. In response to the call, for biker people to stay in biker, a phased demolition and building programme was drawn up and you can see the areas marked out on this drawing on the left. The perimeter block in the council's plan was transformed into the biker wall, which you can see on the photograph on the right, with a majority of the rest of the area being high density, low rise housing, with parking on the outer edges and a combination of pedestrianised streets and courtyards within. The policy of phased development didn't mean that everyone could move into new biker. Some areas had already been cleared prior to Erskine's appointment and new space standards meant that it wasn't possible to provide the same number of residences, but many people were able to stay. However, and this is something that I'll come back to later in the talk, the impact of living in a clearance area for many years, especially for older people, um, was something that was extremely negative but was also something that many children appeared to have enjoyed and perhaps a little too much. And in this photograph on the right, you can see a child standing on the top of a pile of what looks like prefabricated wooden housing panels. After getting the job, Erskine appointed an architect who'd worked for him previously, Vernon Gracie, to head up the Newcastle office. The office itself was based in an old funeral parlor in the center of the northern part of Biker and had an open door policy. The architects, along with the council, took a variety of different approaches to engaging with residents, including regular meetings where plans were outlined and frustrations were aired. And you can see one of the architects, I think that was Roger Tillotson here, at one such meeting, sitting in front of an enormous plan of Biker. They also engaged with other professionals in the area and involved themselves in every aspect of community life. In Erskine's reappraisal of Biker, he also highlights his commitment to paying attention to special groups and this excerpt from the report reads, we would pay special attention to the needs of special groups, small children, teenagers, old people, invalids, etc., and to present extended family structures and possible changes which may take place in these. And it's this focus on children which, which interests me and, and I'm now gonna outline some of my methods for researching this. So the Erskine office included both architects and landscape architects, and they worked very closely together throughout the development, um, partly as many of them have described to me, because it's on this sloping site and because of the nature of, of the sort of layouts of the housing and what they were doing with spaces in between, they had to work very closely together and there were overlaps. 
um, in, in their roles, really. Um, you can see them sitting outside the office here. Members of the Swedish office would also join them for extended periods. They were part of the council's biker group who had weekly meetings in the early stages and then monthly meetings later on to talk about every detail of the development. And these meetings included representatives from planning, housing, the engineers department, and at different points, the city architects, public health, parks and recreation, city surveyor, and so on, were all involved. And this was really a groundbreaking interdisciplinary project for the council. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about it here, but many people that I've talked to who were involved in BICA, it, it sort of had an impact, that interdisciplinary work had an impact on, on a lot of their subsequent work whatever it is they went on to do. So while it's possible to write a purely archival history of Biker, I also wanted to know what it was like to work and live in Biker, and how did people feel about this work and what did they feel to be their achievements and struggles? What did they consider their approach to be to be designing for children? And what did they think of working that working on Biker had meant for their own practice? So I carried out and I'm still carrying out uh, semi-structured interviews with professionals who worked on or in Biker. And this has been really invaluable in re revealing many of their different subjective experiences. Sort of time and resources meant that I'm not able to do full oral histories. And so I am taking a social science approach really in, in recording into sort of in interviews and transcribing them. Um, but these transcriptions will, will be kept, although the recordings, as, as Marie mentioned, the recordings are not of a high enough quality. And I haven't gone about these with with a kind of full oral history in, in mind. However, they are quite lengthy semi-structured interviews with a very strong biographical element. Um, and to date, I've interviewed uh, two architects, a landscape architect, three planners, and two community workers. And I have got a number of further interviews with architects and landscape architects lined up. So the second set of interviews, which I'm doing, is with people who grew up in Biker in the 1970s. And these are adults who are mostly in their 40s now, maybe early 50s. Having found so much material in the archive relating to children, either complaints about them or plans to design playground that were often disrupted, I wanted to find out what they remembered about growing up in Biker. Again, these are subjective experiences, but they give insights into what children at that time did and how they felt about where they lived, albeit with a nostalgic perspective. Still, they are an important missing voice, um, given that their representation in the archive, with the exception of, of the drawings and their drawings and the appearance that they make in photographs, is always from an adult perspective. Um, and actually, the photographs in themselves, in, it coupled with some of the interviews, um, are, are quite interesting because often what the interviewees are describing are things that we see, I see it, it, again in photographs. So, for example, children, um, the benches for children were things to sit on, but a lot of the time they were also things to climb on. Um, and, and this was something that the, the architects and landscape architects were, were kind of happy to have, knew would happen or felt happy that, that that's what they would be used for. So the first phase of Biker to be completed in 1971 was the pilot project. Uh, a small site which had already been cleared was used to test both housing types and the methods of participation and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here but suffice to say that over the best part of a year meetings were held with future residents to talk about what they would like in their new housing and here you can see them visiting the scheme while it's under construction. The new development received a great deal of press and in, in this little excerpt from City Life it talks about the scheme's positive reception um, and you can see a photograph proclaiming these biker children as planners of the future. However, no play equipment was ch for children was actually provided in this scheme. Um, there was a sand pit uh, in early drawings, but it was removed prior to construction at the request of residents uh, during these this kind of consultation meetings. And as part of the follow up, uh, once residents moved in and ongoing consultation, the architects invited them to give their feedback on the scheme. And this resulted in a long list of complaints about problems relating to the built fabric of the scheme and also social problems which residents considered that there should be physical solutions to. The main complaint was about noise, usually noisy children, but there were also complaints about children playing on the stairs, playing on drain pipes, playing football, 
running through newly landscaped areas, drawing on the walls of the passageways beneath the flats, balancing on fences and so on. There are requests for police present, presence and to put gates and fences up in various places. Most of these changes were resisted by the architects and planners, and this would be the first of many points of conflict between adults and children during the development of FICA. So from this point in my talk, I'm going to let my interviewees take over and, and do more of the talking. Um, interviews with adults who grew up in the pilot scheme can provide valuable insights into that child's perspective. And I'm gonna read out part of an interview that I carried out with one such person. He was one of the early residents of the scheme and was three or four when he first moved in. He talked about the close knit community and the special occasions like bonfire night and New Year's Eve when everyone would leave their doors open. And talking about things they used to do there, he said, so what we used to do, those stairs next to us, they would go up to next door's house, which went over the arch. Kids used to sit on the stairs because it was protected from the weather. There was also lots of stairs on the estate and we used to ride our grifters, our bikes down the stairs and up the stairs, but just a high jinx thing, not trying to upset people. Thinking back on it, it was probably quite dangerous. And there are archways here as well. We used to live next to archways. So like a house or flat over an archway. When it was raining, we spent a lot of time playing pitch and toss or football cards, loads of time around there. Harbottle Park as well. We used to spend a lot of time over there. There was a lot of building going on at that time. There were terraced houses there all the way down and you had all the Clydesdale Road up here as well. And when I was little, we used to collect bonfire wood. I shouldn't say this really, we used to trespass. We used to get in these old houses which were derelict and take the doors and timber and collect it for bonfire night. We used to have a bonfire just up here. So they were fleeced for bonfire wood for bonfire night. When they were building these, I shouldn't say it like, all the children used to go on the building site and play in the excavations. It was a good place. So these insights and, and others help did help make a lot of sense of, of some of the decisions about what happened in Biker and, and to get a sense of when, when adults who were, were, were kind of seeing some children's play, which was very innocent, the sort of sitting on chairs and chatting, and then other children's play, which was kind of highly destructive and sometimes um, dangerous. So this jumping forwards is now to the late 70s. This is Dunn Terrace, which was completed in 1978. Now play structures for young children were provided in this scheme. And I spoke to one former resident who'd moved in there into a new house when he was about four. And he had very detailed and very happy memories of his childhood there. And he described these play areas as follows. In this one here, there's a gap here. There's no house, so there's a play area here, which was full of little wooden huts, which were all multicolored, brightly colored, there was tables, but the tables were all really small. They were only for kids, because it was basically impossible for adults to get inside these little huts. They were round like this with little windows, fantastic. They were basically the sort of thing you'd pay a lot of money for to have in your posh garden in Jesmond. And they were just outside our houses. And then in this little bit, there was a boat, a wooden boat, which was enormous, I remember. And we slowly destroyed this stuff over 10 years. And one bit of wood would get damaged in the roof, the water's coming in and it wouldn't get repaired. And then we'd realize you could pick bits of it up and use it as something else and build something else. And things got slowly destroyed over about 10 years to about 85, eight, something like that. And it was already by that point, I look back and I see the council did nothing. You can understand that it cost a hell of a lot of money. And I'm talking about a tiny area here. And it was a huge area. There was loads of play things all over. And I don't remember any of them getting repaired. And I wonder, wonder around now, and the planting was gorgeous, Budlier. My wife hates Budlier. I still love the smell. It's a bit of a weed and a bit scruffy and ugly, but it was all maintained pretty well to begin with. It smelt gorgeous. There were roses and plants everywhere. It was completely green. They'd put loads of mature trees in, so that was gorgeous. And even by the time I left, it was all starting to go, and now it's just bare soil and concrete. And the themes of destruction and maintenance and care came up repeatedly in other interviews. Now, this is what Jerry Kemp, one of the landscape architects, had to say. We were very much aware, and we kept banging on to the city about this, that we were doing stage one of the design. There's nothing here. We're going to design something, but we expect you, the city, over time, to be involved in stages two, three, four. Because what we're doing in stage one, we don't want to see this in 10 years' time. 
particularly with the planting, because kids being kids, the stuff we had to plant at the start of the scheme was pretty robust and brutal sort of stuff. And we wanted it to be phased out through maintenance over a period of time so that you've got something more considered. And we overplanted trees, for example. We didn't expect all those trees to be retained. And of course, what the city did, the thing's got to be preserved. And now you've got this bloody problem on site where there's trees that have got to a ridiculous size that shouldn't be there. They should have gone years ago. And we were really naive, but we hoped the city could. And one of the things we pushed for was that we should build a depot in Biker and that Biker was big enough to have its own dedicated staff. Now, the way the city operated its maintenance at the time, it more or less operated on a three year cycle. And once they'd gone through an area, they wouldn't be back for three years. So some of it fell off, it would stay falling off. Whereas if you had a team based on the site, they could be doing a bit of landscape work, fixing a gate, fixing a gutter, putting a new lock on a door, they would be picking up all the little issues and they'd live on the scheme and they'd know the scheme. We never won that battle with the city. So there are many drawings of play equipment in the archive and photographs of children using some of it. And they were often positioned in the courtyards. And this is an idea which Mike Drage, one of the architects thought came from Sweden, but perhaps didn't translate very well here. And this is what he said about it. To go back a step further, the Swedish idea of children playing was a lot to do with the things that probably Ralph had done in Sweden and other people had done. It was courtyard housing with a space in the middle and it had its little community building, which was the commun communal laundry. And this was housing association housing effectively. And you had a communal room and 50, 60, 100 flats in a group around that space. And it was semi-private space, space that generally people respected. And it had some play equipment in it. And I think it was the kind of model that the Swedes in the office were thinking of. But Swedish society has what we used to jokingly call Swedish law and order, which is, you know, that they're much more serious and conforming people. And so this, these courtyards that are designed in this way with this, this kind of I idealism um, built in and really over time, I think many, many of the architects and landscape architects became very frustrated with with what happened in them and how people responded to them. Um, probably the most difficult uh, and controversial play space in Biker was planned for Priory Green. Now Priory Green actually isn't even green at this point. On the photograph it's the large area to the left with a circle, you can see a circle in it. And this was supposed to be the main um, green space in Biker which was to replace Biker Park. And before this scheme was built, there was an adventure playground here just to the southeast of the architect's office. And I actually think that, I can't remember, I think it's sort of about, this might be it here. It's probably towards the end of its life. And I spoke to um, Dale Bolland, who'd worked in the adventure playground while studying planning at university. And he subsequently worked in the council planning department and worked on biker. And, and really the experience of the adventure playground is, it says a lot about how I think the, it explains a lot about why residents uh, reacted in the way they did to play structures. He says, it was just outside the architect's office on Priory Green, that whole area there, we used to build structures and then they'd get burned down the next night and then we'd build them again. And eventually we got a kind of compromise about how the thing worked. And I remember coming up and I was all naive and stuff like, and I thought you've got to treat all the kids equally and stuff like that. But there were so many kids there and such a wide range that after a week or two, I eventually worked out how you did it was to have an arrangement with the oldest kids. There were all these kids, like hundreds of kids, but I worked out that if you had this arrangement with the older kids, they would control the kids slightly younger, all the way down to the little kids. So me and the older kids, they were friends for ages afterwards. After, after I stopped doing that, they used to, some of the badder ones, used to appear at my house, um, Dale lived in Biker, uh, after running away from the police one way or another. Ernie lived in my coal yard for about three days trying to escape the police. But it was always in those days, it was always Biker kids, used to do quite a lot of stealing, taking lead off roofs and stuff like that. But they didn't do any violence or anything like that. The West End kids were the ones that did the violence and you wanted to avoid that, but the biker kids were bad, but in a nice way. He also compared working here to working in another adventure playground earlier on in London. I think the London one was a bit more organised. The kids weren't as wild as kids up here. The kids here were fantastic. They looked after each other. 
there was a young kid in a wheelchair that the older kids looked after all the time. And I remember them holding this kid up on a roof. They were stripping lead off this roof and they hauled the kid up, the wheelchair kid up onto the roof just to be part of it. It was incredible. Some of the architects had a different perspective on the adventure playground. Um, Mike Drage describes it here. It was certainly there, just thinking about sitting in the office. I went into the office one bonfire night just to be there in case, just to prevent the office being burnt down because there was an enormous fire being built on the edge of the adventure playground. I've got a photograph of that bonfire from my desk in the lean-to in the new office. So that was a few years into my stay in Biker. And it was certainly there, I think, in 71. So it might have been there until Gordon Road was built because it would have been cleared for that. And there were plans to build, to when that adventure playground was removed, to build a permanent playground. But because of the difficulties that they'd found in convincing residents that it was a good idea, they then turned to, to experimentation. And actually in this little archive excerpt here, you can see them talking about another instance of, of, trying, to, of, of trying to kind of prove that something would work in the way of, of play equipment. And I'll read this one out. It says, stage one, play area for small children in Carville Road. The equipment, e.g. climbing frames, sandboxes, seesaws, etc., would be tried out to establish which types of equipment would be most suitable, to develop these to make them as attractive as possible and as resistant to abuse as possible, to determine the degree and hopefully the cost of maintenance, to try to convince the housing department to a more positive view on play areas. So here, this is the housing department who are uncertain, but this is very much because of the way that residents have reacted and, and, and the sort of destruction of some of the other of play equipment. So I'd found this photograph um, partly as a result of an interview that I'd done um, with somebody who talked about the, the, the paddling pool here. And this is Roger Tillotson, another of the architects, describing how this came about. But to go right to the beginning, because it was felt that again, like the participation in the pilot scheme, what do the children need? And Anna and Per Hedaris built this thing just outside the office. You know, the office was on the corner of Brinkburn Street and Carville Road. And once Carville Road had been stopped to traffic, they built with timber walls around it, up to around a metre and put a sand pit in it and various other things for children to play, including a tree box and quite a tall tree. And again, there were no trees in Biker, of which there are lots now, and people understood that, how trees could change. But then there's the approach of, well, what sort of birds are going to come in and so on? They all knew about pigeons. So that was right outside the office, and Dina, Pehadera's wife, was instrumental in that too, and in playing with the children. I think originally this box had water in it, but that had to get filled in when the children decided that Dina ought to go for a swim and tried to push her in. But anyway, it gave us some idea of working with children. And in another interview, Mike Drage talks about the evolution of playgrounds and who was involved. Oh yes, he was involved with the adventure playground and the temporary playground things we did. And we also had a guy called Ken Robert, who was a shipyard craftsman in Swans, and his wife Margaret, who worked as a secretary and the filing clerk initially in our office and became secretary and stayed forever. But Ken was one of the Swan Hunter craftsmen and the office managed to pay him the odd bit of cash every now and then from Vernon Gracie's lecture fees which went into a kind of playground fund to do things like carving totem poles. You've probably seen photographs. Ken carved totem poles. He made climbing frames just out of simple plain timber, painted blue or red or whatever. And those things we handed over to the builders to put into Biker. You know, we had a Ken Robert project on our minds, even if it was just to carve a couple of features to go into a playground. So there was that. And as Jerry has said, Anna Nilsson, he trained as a furniture designer, so he was very much into wood and became a sort of self-taught landscape designer. Ali, five minutes, please. Okay, thanks. So the in, these interviews kind of brought, have brought other people in, like Dina Herderis and Ken Robert, who I might not have come across if I had just been looking at the archive. So another story which came out of an interview, um, which I was later to find photographs of, was the creation of some paving by the children. And um, Roger Tillotson describes this. There was one aspect where the children were very much involved. Have you been to where our office was? Outside that, on the west side, I suppose, there's some paving, which is like a beach. And that was done through Arna Nielsen, I think, with a local sculptor. And it's a cast of Tynemouth Beach. 
made into pavings. And you know, that's just an interesting thing to break up what would otherwise be a monotonous bit of tarmac. Anyway, from that idea, we thought, well, why don't we involve the children in this? And slightly on another phase, a bit closer to Avondale House, we thought we'd get some children and get them to cast some things. And they got some vegetables like carrots and potatoes and things and cast concrete onto them and made these steps. Well, of course, concrete is okay if it's properly tamped and consolidated and things, but visually they were never a real success. But the point was that we'd involve the children in making them and with the idea that the children were going to live around here. And maybe there's a bit of pride in I've made those steps sort of idea. So finally, um, after many discussions about Priory Green, um, it was it, there was not ever a playground built there. And the photograph um, on the right here, you can see what was well. There was a proposals for a rose garden, but actually this was this circle of stones with trees was was what was finally built. Residents, uh, it said in the archive, living around Priory Green, said they did not want the stones and play equipment on the green. Mr Kenrick explained that the open space is for people in the area as well as those living immediately around the green. It's part of the replacement for Biker Park and therefore provision has to be made for children to play. However, despite all of that, the residents seem to have won the day. But the photograph on the left is of another play area, not very far away actually, um, which Mike Drage talked about. Um, uh, he said that the very first play equipment which I ever drew in Biker was in Kendall Street. Tony Smith, who was the job architect, and I just sat down and said, maybe we could build a climbing frame in this corner and make a bit of an enclosure and put a seat and a table in with that change of level. We'll have a little slide, but we'll just do it in concrete and the kids can just slide down it. It was a health and safety nightmare, but it was built and it was used, but it fell victim to complaints, partly about noise and intrusion and partly about health and safety. And perhaps there was more timber and less concrete in the next one, but we never dreamed of buying in commercial play equipment or providing soft services. So we could get away with all sorts of things which wouldn't be planned these days. And as time goes on, um, there's a move away from trying to put in play structures because it, it I think I, I haven't interviewed um, Per uh, Gustafsson, who was the Swedish landscape architect, but I spoke to him briefly on the phone and he said they were, it was very frustrating. They were asked, constantly being asked to move play equipment from what, one play, place to the next. Um, and that the council never really did ever buy into, into maintaining it and into, into the idea that it should be kept. So some of the things, some of the structures that were built at a later date um, were these little little um, shelters, but also circles of stone with structures in them. Um, and in an interview with Mike Drage, he says, so when I did Churton Street, the landscape architecture input was mainly from Per Gustafsson at that point. Per had a kind of signature thing, which was circles everywhere. Within that, we'd largely decided not to build identifiable play equipment. Although in one of the larger courtyards, we had a kind of Wendy house come slide thing, which was a one-off really, and lasted quite a long while. But we also had quite a few shelters which were not definable as play equipment. They were just four posts with a roof across. And of course, kids would accumulate in them. But of course, you could say they were just there for people waiting for the bus. They weren't defined as play structures. Um, and then finally, um, much of the landscape in Biker, when talking to both the landscape architect, Jerry Kemp, talked a lot about this idea of a playable landscape, but also the children, the adults who were children who grew up there, also themselves described a lot of things that, that wasn't that wasn't play equipment. Um, and Jerry Kemp said, so everything in the detailing from the timber stairs going into gardens offers a sort of space to hide underneath or climb on. The tables and the chairs around the place offer as much play potential as play equipment does, frankly. The big problem with play equipment, particularly in the type of layout that Biker was, where you have a courtyard, is it's popular for three or four months and then the kids get fed up with it or they grow up. And suddenly what you've put there is not appropriate anymore and you can spend a huge amount of money putting in equipment and maintaining it and all of the implications that brings, when in fact if you just provide a pleasant space, the changes in levels, different materials, soft and hard materials, you create something that's got just as much potential, probably more potential actually. 
Now, this is this was slightly contradicted though by the comments of, of one one person that I interviewed who grew up in next to one of these areas with, with the circles. And he said, red and blue our houses were. That's the sort of thing I meant before when I said the square in front of our house had a little circular area. And I think it did have benches inside, not play equipment or anything like that, just somewhere to sit and have a chat or whatever, like a breakout spaces in the middle of the square. So there were a couple of them in front of my house, very much like that, that one. Maybe it had play equipment in it originally. They weren't really serving their purpose without the play equipment. I don't remember any play equipment there. And Jerry also talked, I'm almost finished now, Jerry also talked um, about his own childhood uh, and, 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 and this he felt, I think it felt informed how his approach to landscape. He said, I remember from my own childhood playing in back lanes, there weren't play areas. You didn't need play areas. One of the games was in the summer when the weather was hot, the tar used to come up between the cobbles. And it, it sounds like a hover's advert this, but you used to pull this stuff out and you could model with it. And the kids liked to sort of fiddle about in small areas. And for all I have a love of sport myself and was keen on sport, I was never one for sort of pushing the problem with something like a football feed as it sterilises such a huge area and a lot of kids aren't into that. The big playground, you get, tend to get some bullying, you get one or two kids who take over and a lot of kids just avoid them. And a lot of kids just play in either solitary play or ones or twos and they fiddle about, you know, build things, make things. So it seemed totally logical to us to create a rich environment that sparked imagination. Um, and I should just give the final word to, to one of the people who grew up in Biker. Um, they, they talked a lot about, about bikes and about hanging out and about making bogeys out of pram wheels. Um, but, but just to end, um, one of them says, the estate itself, just for hide and seek, it was possibly the best hide and seek estate on the planet. It was amazing with all the landscaping and features in there. Some of the buildings are on stilts as well, which was brilliant because you could play out in the rain underneath the stilts. We had a property on stilts just inside of my house, so whenever it rained, you'd get 20 kids playing underneath the houses on the stilts. It was brilliant because you could play in the rain. Um, and, and I'll just finish there, but, but really, uh, um, just to, to, to sum up, I found that the, the interviews um, offer a really different, different kind of type of material and different way of thinking about some of the archives that, I, that I've been looking at um, and, and really make us think a little bit differently about those houses on stilts that are so maligned um, that maybe do offer something for, for children and young people.